Okay, let me just make sure the clicker is doing the clicker thing. The clicker is doing the clicker thing, yay! Okay, so um, yes, welcome to the new OS Top 10. Um, for those of you who have seen this talk at the 20th anniversary, uh, it's mostly the same. There are some additional slides because there is uh, there was some considerable time constraints at the uh, 20th anniversary. But for those of you who have not seen it, um, you can tell that we've got a new look. Let's check it out. So the top 10 has always been about risks, not impacts, likelihoods, or vulnerabilities. It's not about the, the breach value. Uh, there are many people who are upset with us for not um, ordering the OS top 10 in their preferred uh, way, or the things that are in the OS top 10 aren't necessarily the things that they think are the most important. So depending on your view of the data, um, they may disagree with our ordering, but I'll have one thing to say to them, which is essentially either get more data than us, and we have 515,000 apps worth of data, or as Brian Glass did, who's now a co-leader, have a better analysis. Um, we're going to be making the data available. Um, I am actually missing an OS top 10 leaders to, um, meeting at the moment, but that's okay. Um, we absolutely intend to release the entire data set so that you can do your own data analysis. Um, the thing that is sort of important though, is that we did some changes to the way that we collect the data and analyze the data. And so we bucketed it. And one of those things that's different is we encourage everybody to think about the OS top 10 as a starting point. It is the bare minimum to avoid negligence. Therefore, if it's A1 or A10, you should be doing it all. It's one of the very few things that is one of the reasons why the OS top 10 is not a standard. That means that you should be doing everything even if it's A9 or A7 or A3, um, you shouldn't just be doing the top three and hoping that's not going to be enough. So um, you can disagree with about us, the ordering. Uh, I'm very happy for that to happen because it's not supposed to be, these are the most important things. We're going to do them in order. Okay, the audience is obviously developers, lead developers and architects. And because we made that change in the 2017 version, um, we have actually seen an impact and the impact is injection, even when cross site scripting and JavaScript injection is shoved into injections, it is no longer number one. It wasn't even close. So that is actually the impact we're trying to have. We don't want to have the same list for 20, you know, seven updates in a row that makes no value to anybody, but it does show the value of the original data set um, established by uh, Dave Wickers and Jeff Williams, they created the first version in 2003 using the information they had to hand from their consultancy at the time, which was Aspect Security. Um, full disclosure, I worked for Aspect in the late 2000s. Um, and obviously during that time, I was the OS top 10 leader at the same time. We obviously will want framework developers to continue their work. And I think this is where we've had the biggest change. Cross-site scripting has fallen off the map because people are now using Vue, React, and other relatively safe um, um, frameworks that you really do have to go out of your way to shoot yourself in the foot. You still can, it's JavaScript, um, but if you do it the right way with using the um, idioms from Vue, React, and whatnot, you just won't have it. And it'll automatically get encoded for you correctly and therefore you don't have cross-site scripting by doing no additional work. That's exactly what we need people to continue to do is not only adopt better frameworks, but for framework developers to look at our list and actually start to work on bug classes and then remediate those bug classes. Of course, we are looking at program managers such as CISOs, CTOs, head of AppSec. Uh, we do want people to look at the OS top 10 as being a starting point and not an end um, journey. Um, so we actually do have some stuff for them, but of course, everybody else, AppSec professionals, consultancies, tools, tool vendors, uh, trainers, and others, they all use the OS top 10, various people claim compliance with it. And I'll talk to you about why that's not possible in a little bit. The leaders as they stand, um, in 2017, Dave Wickers handed over the, the leadership to myself. Um, we had to redo the 2017 one in a bit of a hurry. Uh, we had to do reopen 
the data collection a little bit and do much better data analysis, which is, again is actually how Brian became a co-leader. I love that sort of constructive element of our community. Um, he provided a three-part uh, blog post that basically described all of the problems with our data analysis and the quality of the data we had. Uh, by bringing him on board, it, the top 10 has never been more data-driven than it has been in the past. Um, the quality of the data analysis is also much better now. So a lot of the early work in 2020 was done by Brian. And we'll talk about the impact of 2020 in a little bit, but Brian, Torsten, Neil, and myself, one of the things that makes a very healthy OWASP project is having multiple leaders. Um, I, we recently uh, added Eli Lang as a co-lead of the ASVS because he brings fresh insight and a healthy um, contrary view to some of us because he's an actual practitioner. He has to use the ASVS in his day job and therefore he understands its weaknesses and its issues. And that makes a much stronger project if you are running a project or leading a project, don't be afraid of getting more leaders. OWASP Foundation supports up to five leaders of a project. Uh, you can have as many project contributors as you wish. And we encourage that tremendously. It has made the OWASP Top 10 a far stronger document in both 2017 and in 2021. So as I mentioned, injection is no longer number one, which is fantastic, finally. When we actually analyzed and bucketed all the data, um, we combined all of the different types of injections. So there is a pattern where intermingled uh, user supplied data is intermingled with program structure. That's a very bad pattern. And I wish nothing did it, but it is a, like it's a fundamental feature of almost everything. So we are absolutely committed to helping people to use better frameworks that can help you avoid this issue. By combining all of the CWEs that had that injection pattern into one, it no longer was one. It wasn't two. It eventually rose to, I think, three or four. We'll, we'll check it out as we go through. We made it shorter by design. I was adamant that we were making it mobile first. For those of you who have not seen it yet, it's at oas.org slash top 10. It is now consumable directly on a mobile phone, even with a little tiny iPhone 13 mini, it works just fine on that. And that's really important to me because people consume media not in printed form anymore, not in A4 or US letter, but on their mobiles. The cheat sheets are by far the most popular um, website at OWASP because it is mobile friendly. And I hope that the top 10 will take the cheat sheets place, but we'll see. There's a lot of very, very practical advice for the cheat sheets, and I think it will still be a very popular site regardless. We are currently working on finishing up the PDF and a wall poster. We want, as people start to go back to their cubicles or if they're working from home, to be able to have a single page poster of the OS Top 10 that basically explains what it is and what you can do about it and where to get more information. That'll be developer centric. It won't be AppSec professional centric. Um, if people want to contribute additional posters, work with us. Obviously, we have refreshed the look. We are working with Hugo, um, a longtime uh, uh, graphic designer who knows OWAS in and out. He has actually given us a new design language, and we're going to be using him to produce the PDF and also the wall posters. I finally gave up. We do realize people use the OWAS Top 10 as a standard. I call it a pseudo standard because it's not a very good one and also as a basic AppSec program. So say, for example, you're coming from an environment where it was just one person and they didn't think about application security at all. How do you start an AppSec program using the OS Top 10? We have small chapters on both of those and where to go from here. It's really important to understand that OpenSAM is a much better choice than the OS Top 10 for this, but there's also other elements to getting a secure um, development lifecycle that is agile friendly that works with DevSecOps, that actually does things that doesn't introduce stage gates because stage gates are evil and they have to die. Anyway, the other thing we've done is we've actually re-normalized all the titles. They are now just about root causes and this may cause people concern. We realized in uh, 2017 that sensitive data exposure was a symptom and not a root cause. 
And now, because, you know, we did actually have elements of SDE throughout the OS Top 10 2017, it's now in its own uh, little bucket of access control. So what we want you to do is actually think about those root causes and what you can do about them, rather than trying to put band-aids over the symptoms. We don't want band-aids, we want fundamental change to your code so that we actually see improvements again. I'd love to see a number of the OS top 10 items shuffle around in order, but also go away like XXE did. XXE was in, like very easily fixed by just simply updating your software and turning off a little bit of configuration. And because developer tooling can actually highlight that issue, um, it went away. It's not even in the top 20. That's a fantastic change. That's the sort of impact we are looking for. We do have some new categories, including insecure design, which is not a bucket. We'll talk about that when we get to it, but it is a fundamental root cause of many of the issues. And we'll talk about those. As always, there's things that are on the cusp, things that didn't quite make it in that are still important and you should consider them. We did a little write up of what those categories are. We didn't prioritize them in terms of their risk or their exploitability or anything like that. Um, so everything in A11 is of equal weighting. However, by the time you get to the bottom of the A11, you're looking at something that occurs in less than 1% of all applications. So the reality is, should you continue going, I would recommend using the ASVS rather than A11. So where are we at? We did actually have a bit of a problem. And the reason why the OS top 10 is late is because in 2020, there was a pandemic and we just didn't have the data. We had less than 30 or 40,000 apps worth of data uh, when we needed to start writing this time last year. It wasn't enough. Uh, the data we had was also of one particular type, which was static code analysis, which skews uh, the results away from high um, confidence findings. For those of you who are unfamiliar, static code analysis has false positives galore. And when you turn off the false positives, you get almost no results. So the idea of static code analysis is to guide you through hot and cold spots to start identifying um, what are those issues. I know a lot of places will not give static code analysis tools to developers because they are just, you know, hello world might have 10,000 false positives. I'm exaggerating there, but I would, ex I would suggest to you that it has a very different skew on the data compared to bug bounties, which someone paid out, like the results from the bug bounty organizations, people acknowledged the issue, it was a real issue, and someone got paid, whether it was through karma, a t-shirt, or money, someone got a reward for, com for completing a bug um, report. So we know that, for example, bug bounties have some of the strongest possible data, but there's not a lot of it compared to, say, for example, uh, from boutiques, from static code analysis and whatnot. So this sort of data analysis, we needed more data and we needed more types of sources. And so we've broken it down into humans assisted by tools, tools assisted by humans and fully automated. Um, those sort of data buckets allowed us to normalize the data so that no one type of data overwhelmed any other type of data, but also that then introduces what you may disagree with our weighting is what I'm trying to get at. So we're trying to make the data available so you can do your own analysis. You may be more concerned with what bug bounties are finding and you can sort of highlight it down to those areas. Um, my personal opinion is that sometimes the, the, the market for bug bounties sometimes skews away from things that are easily fixed that then build up to a real bug in some other way. Um, it's like in the early days of bug bounties, people thought that, you know, um, use after free wasn't exploitable and then it was, and then all of a sudden all of those bug bounties that where that was closed off as not an exploitable issue becomes a really big deal. So I think the market for bug bounty data is very, very important. I think it's a very useful tool. However, you do need to actually start to think about what is the thing that most influences me and my changes. So to learn more about that, please watch Brian Glass's talk. Um, his talk at the 20th anniversary was recorded. 
I'm currently editing all the talks and we'll be putting them up and making them available to OWASP members first. And then by about Christmas time, we'll be making them available to everybody. Um, we want to make sure that our members are, um, have access to our um, conferences and our talks much earlier than the general population. We'll be making the keynotes free, um, but generally uh, if it's a talk at a conference, uh, particularly paid conferences, members will get access to that material first and for free after the event has finished. So let's get down to it. What is the OWASP Top 10 saying this time? Um, this is one of my favorite photos. It comes from, um, I found it on Bruce Shania's um, blog uh, in 2007, which sort of shows you that the, this has been around forever. It shows a picture of a snowy field with tire marks all over it going around the, um, the access control mechanism and people are parked on the other side of there. So they got themselves free parking by just simply driving around the security control. And that's exactly what we do. Broken access control has always been one of my favorites and I'm glad it got to number one. Um, it was definitely a miss in the 2007 version. There was enough data in the 2007 version if we didn't have two crypto related findings or categories in the 2007. Broken access control would have been in the top 10 2007 and maybe we would have avoided some of this stuff. Um, the reality is, is that broken access control is something I would invest at least a third of my time doing source code reviews and penetration testing because it pays off. I reviewed a logistical a piece of logistics software that's used by governments throughout the world to maintain things. I'm not going to talk about what those things are because I don't know if the vendor has fixed it. Um, but let's just say that I was able to act as an administrator without logging in because nobody, including every single penetration tester and source code reviewer before me, in the last 20 years, because this software was not young, had never bothered checking access control matrices. And the developers hadn't either, even though it's functionally testable. So this is an example of where you can get access to some really juicy bug payout, bug bounty payouts by testing for access control. I think it's really worthwhile doing, and it's certainly worthwhile dedicating up to a third of your testing time to creating an access control matrix and testing it. It's not just about breaching and getting data out. I mean, obviously with the Pandora papers recently, there was a lot of um, focus on reading data that's not supposed to be out. The reality is, is you can also cause problems by creating new records and creating garbage or altering existing records and turning them into junk. For example, giving everybody at a bank a billion dollars in money, um, that is terrible but it's an access control failure. It's not a business logic floor. It's an access control failure. You're allowed to deposit all of this money and you know, corrupt all of these records. You can also delete all the data. You can also think about elevation of privilege. So modifying metadata and um, playing around with uh, tokens and whatnot so that you um, become an administrator or a user that acts outside of your own level of authority. So elevation of privilege is not going away anytime soon. And of course, if you don't have access control checks built into your applications controllers, um, into your data models, um, into your domain logic, you are going to get owned. So I've seen a lot of code over the time that has a very simple setters and getters for um, domain logic. And it's like, why wouldn't you check that the caller has permission to make the changes that allow you to do, you know, high value transactions? It seems like an extra two or three lines of code would allow you to prevent a lot of these problems, even if your front end code uh, changes dramatically. So, you know, when I was looking at some of the code back in the mid 2000s, that code is now exposed as APIs on the internet. And you absolutely do need to make sure that APIs are checking uh, for authorization. You can't just assume that the caller is this trusted application that does the access control checks for you. Um, I've seen that on multiple occasions. So, the reason why it's number one is that it has uh, privacy and regulatory impacts that can cost you an immense fortune. It also has some of the largest breaches and the largest costs, um, you know, going back to the Equifax, um, Equifax, one of the data providers um, breaches back in the um, uh, 2017 era, but there's been so many, um, including the Pandora breaches recently, um, the Epic server release, um, you know, 
it might be considered in the public interest for those releases to occur, but the reality is, is that it's almost certainly some sort of access control that caused that. Number two is cryptographic failures. This is sort of like a bucket of all of the cryptographic issues, including um, bad or malformed, uh, you know, uh, TLS. So if you're not using um, a, an SSL tester of some description, uh, you're probably going to not have um, a great configuration. But it's also some facets of sensitive data exposure. Are, are you properly encrypting records that should be encrypted? Now, do remember that if you have the key that opens that data on the database server and it's applied automatically, then quite possibly you've got clear text equivalent. Um, don't rely upon that sort of thing. Um, but obviously for operational reasons, you may need to do so. What you really trying to prevent there is like, for example, of someone walking out the door with a uh, backup or someone walking out the door with a server containing uh, data they shouldn't have. Some of this will be found using um, static code analysis and code reviews. Others will be found using tooling. I would encourage you to adopt both to just simply to weed this one out. I think this can go down in um, uh, priority because again, a lot of static code, static code analysis tools and CI CD tools will discover this automatically and it needs to be prioritized as technical debt so it can get down. Injections, uh, we are seeing this finally fall down and it's because people are using safer frameworks. They've moved to ORMs and entity frameworks which don't generally have a bog standard SQL injection. They have their own form but generally it's much better. But they're also using um, you know display frameworks, view frameworks that have uh, has less cross-site scripting. Um, obviously, you can't move all your code at once, and so there's still some of that happening. But we're starting to see that in only 3.4% of apps, are we actually getting to the place where injections occur? When it happens, it's really bad. I mean, that's why it's so high. But 3.4% of all apps is pretty low. Um, and that said, it's still being found a lot. We've got 32,000 odd CVEs in 2020. Uh, that represents um, one of those uh, CWEs that is mentioned. Insecure design. Now, it does have 40 CWEs and people might think, hey, this is a bucket. This is where I toss everything that could be potentially described as a design flaw. But you've got to look at it in a particular way, and that is, is the control, should there be a control here? Is it present? Does it work? Is it in use? That's what this is about. And the only way to really find this is to do the real shift left. Jeff Williams had a talk at the 20th anniversary, which I highly recommend you watch when it becomes available, where he talks about shifting wrong, not just shift left. It doesn't mean doing uh, penetration testing earlier. It means working with the developers um, we want to make sure that when we do shift left, we're a part of the team. We're actually building together. You can't review your way to building an application. You absolutely sometimes have to get your hands dirty and actually code. And I would suggest as an AppSec professional, you need to get into threat modeling if you're not already doing it. If you're not threat modeling as a penetration tester, you are missing out because the sorts of threats we're talking about here are the ones that will get the business to fix it. If you can actually show that an attacker, as an attacker, I can view and modify everyone's profiles because you've threat modeled that and you've tested it, there's no control and now I can get in there. All of a sudden, you're, you're actually at a very high level. You're not just running a scanning tool over the application, although you should still do that, uh, to find the low hanging fruit. Threat modeling provides high value business transactions that business truly cares about and they will fix it unlike for example if they find a stack overflow um, or something like that that doesn't really end up with any exploitability that may be there in three years time we want people to adopt better frameworks and what we're suggesting here is um, the, for the appsec teams to work with the development teams to create secure paved roads there's a bunch of really good information on this out there including some talks at apps at Cali and other places um, from panels with um, Netflix, um, others that have adopted what might have been considered a few years ago as a unicorn behavior 
which is this paved road concept. It's essentially saying that the AppSec team will help developer teams build secure AMIs, secure frameworks, and tools to observe where bad patterns occur or out of date paved roads exist. Because one of the things I noted when I was watching one of those talks, when I was preparing these uh, slides, is just because you have a secure AMI doesn't mean it always stays secure. And what happens with a development team doesn't know that they need to update their part of the secure paved road. So building observability into your paved road, who's using it? What version are they using? Is there an issue that they need to address by adopting a later version? It should always be the easiest possible pathway to adopt the paved road rather than doing it the hard way and the insecure way. So you're saving the development team hundreds, if not thousands of hours and eliminating uh, technical debt and eliminating insecurity by working with the development teams, not telling them that their baby is ugly, that gets you absolutely nowhere. Work with the development teams to help them save time, build faster, build more secure. You, it's like a win-win-win for everybody, except for one small problem is that application security professionals are not entirely scalable and there's not a lot of us. But this, again, once you start building it, actually helps with that scalability problem because you don't need to do it again and again and again. You're actually building something that can be used by hundreds of development teams if you're in a very large organization. And that's exactly what you should be trying to do. We want people to do testing. And part of the insecure design issue is that people don't test for functional um, security flaws. We want unit tests, integration tests. And obviously, you can use OSAP with Zest scripting and other um, scripting mechanisms, it's fully API scriptable. You can actually build into the CI CD process full on end to end unit integration and security testing, like penetration testing every single build. That's incredibly powerful. And a lot of security tools that are commercial in nature don't even have that. And yet, one of the tools from OWASP, which is OWASP SAP, has this capability. Make sure you do check out some of our projects like SAP that actually allow you to get into the next generation of security testing. Security misconfiguration. The, we saw this jump, not because the problems have got worse in terms of impact, but because it becomes much more prevalent. Because we're seeing things like Terraform scripts or CloudFormation scripts now being code and checked into the code base, tools can now investigate the configuration of how it's built. And once we start seeing that, you can start saying, well, this is something we can check every single build. And so we're starting to see it appear in the top 10 data set. So again, the solution here is the paved road. We talk about it a fair bit in how to adopt the iOS top 10 as a STLC. Um, honestly, you do need to surface the risk and make it available. I would strongly suggest, um, as we'll see with the uh, um, outdated components, if it's got an outdated component, warn the developers. If it's got a vulnerable component, do not let that get into production. But you also then need to come back and say, well, what is in production that has vulnerable components? And then that's the technical debt that needs to be eliminated now. Uh, I once did some work uh, for an organization. They had 1,300 apps and 90 days to look at them. Imagine if you could just simply look at your CRCD server and say, these are the 15 apps that we need to look at. That's the difference between what I'm suggesting to you here and what we had to do, which is to get approximately 200 people doing um, penetration tests and code reviews uh, in 90 days. Not everybody can do 200 pen tests in, at once for a single customer. Um, that costs a lot of money. Why not just build it into CI CD and reduce and eliminate that money? Here we are with vulnerable and outdated components. Um, it is the root cause of the largest and most costly breach of all time, over $230 million the last time I looked. Um, and that's because Apache Commons was outdated. And it wasn't because Apache Commons, I mean, Apache Commons had another issue inside itself, which allowed this to occur. But this actually is covered off in the latest um, US government executive order. And I know that doesn't apply to other folks in the UK, but honestly, you do need to think about supply chain security. And this has been in the OS top 10 for some considerable period of time now. Um, for those of you who have connections in Australia, the ASD Essential 8 actually covers this in patching applications. Uh, they give you like one day 
I'm not joking, one day to patch replications for things that are really critical. Um, on average, we do see when people have a, a known exploit, it takes them less than four hours to create a, um, a, a, an exploit that can then be abused against you. So anybody who has quarterly patch um, sessions, yeah, you're doing it wrong. So the biggest problem we have here is the CWEs for this are self-referential back to the always top 10, 2013 and 2017. Um, and it's not because this is not a problem. It is. It's definitely a huge problem. It's just the way that CWE is not a requirement. So we are working on, um, there is a team interest, if you're interested in this, um, I think called the common requirements enumeration. And it's going to help bring all of these different things from ISO 27,000 to for example, the IGTC, uh, the OS.10, the ASVS, um, the NIST cybersecurity framework, the idea of CRE will actually enumerate a list of requirements that then can be referred back. And I can guarantee you CRE will have a single category for vulnerable and outdated components. And that means that essentially we can start saying, this is a better way of referring to vulnerabilities not from weaknesses, which is the absence of the uh, ineffective controls, but a missing requirement. And this is one of those times. Identica identification and authentication failures. Um, back in the early 2000s, I had a really long talk with a, a intellectual property lawyer. And one of his concerns back then was this thing called evidence of identity. Um, a lot of the early 2000s in Australia was about know your customer. It wasn't called that back then, um, but essentially it was a very big thing. We had anti-money laundering laws that required 100 points of proof that you are who you say you are. Um, so if you ever wondered why the OS Top 10 2017, the ASVS, and now the 10 2021 prohibits questions and answers, is because it's not a very strong uh, know your customer. It's literally along the lines of if I happen to know my birth date, where I was born and what my school mascot is, you've got a pretty good chance if I actually used those actual answers. That's terrible OPSEC. So anybody who's on LinkedIn, who's on Twitter, who's had a birthday party, you're relying upon the good graces of others to not breach your operational security. So questions and answers are absolutely prohibited in NIST 800-63. They're actually prohibited in the ASVS. They're prohibited in the OS top 10 for the last four years. Get rid of them. There's a difference between the evidence of identity. Who is this person? And what are the claims they're making to say that this is who I am? Um, and controls around authentication. Obviously, we want to protect against uh, reused or breached passwords. Um, I'm not asking you to crack it, but my, um, my Microsoft account I've had the same password since 1997. It is a random password. It is very long. It's never been breached. Therefore, I don't need to change it. And this is what I'm trying to get across to folks. Unless it's breached, it's unimportant as to what the password is, as long as you've got MFA, which I do for that account. But also, use strong passwords. Use a password manager. And that's what we ask you to do. We also encourage you to look at ASVS levels uh, V2 and V3 at level one, it's really important. Um, it's almost 100% aligned with what NIST 800-63 does. So if you're a risk information manager, you know, a risk manager or someone who has to comply with a bunch of different standards, we went out of our way not to create new problems for you and unique controls that if you do the ASVS, you are doing something unique compared to NIST. What we really want is ISO 27002 and others to catch up. We don't want to basically force you to do a whole ton of new things when there is this really good evidence-based uh, criteria, which is NIST 800-63, that you should be doing to protect your application. Once you eliminate people who you don't know, you have no idea who they are, you get rid of them, you're now stuck with people you've probably got with some sort of contractual arrangement and they've signed something or they've agreed to some level of um, terms of service rather than just some random hacker on the internet. That changes the, the context of what you can do about breaches after they've logged in. So this is an essential component. It might be number seven, but it's right up there. It's just that we, because people have started to adopt MFA, we are starting to see this 
fall down. It's only in 2.6% of apps. So you're starting to see this is becoming rarer and rarer, and I love it. This is exactly the sort of impact that we want with the iOS top 10. Software and data integrity failures is a new one. Um, this is a root cause. What we're trying to say here is that applications aren't doing a very good job at the moment of protecting the integrity of data. For those of you who have done CSSPs or CISSPs, we'll know that there's the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of this triad of the information security world. The iOS top 10 for a long time had nothing for the integrity part of it, but it was there and it's in 2% of all apps that you can violate the integrity of the data within the app, the app itself, or the update mechanism. So I was participating in a, uh, a software build and materials workshop recently, and there was a lot of bike shedding around whether or not we needed to know how software was built, what flags were built, and how to reproduce a build. What does that actually even mean with something like Microsoft 365? I mean, that's a, a piece of software that updates itself almost daily. What does it even mean to know how Microsoft compiled that code when you don't have access to that code? I think there's a lot of stuff that's still outstanding here, but I do know that having a software bill of materials that says, here is a tool that you can use to verify that everything you've received is legit. And that you, like for example, if you're a developer and you're a node developer, you know that if you include um, Express, you're probably gonna have around 1200, 1300 other things pulled in from NPM just simply to make Express go. Do you trust every single one of them? How do you know it's real? Did you get that from a real repo that's run by the NPM project? If not, what are you gonna do about it? Well, this is something that we have identified that happens like 2% of the time, software updates, CICD, software um, sub-resource integrity, build repos that come from untrusted sources, we want to make sure that all of these things are dealt with. I think it's relatively straightforward. Um, I would recommend for the folks to um, have a read of this section and understand what it's really about before starting to say, oh, but that can only be addressed with. No. It can be reason reasonably easily addressed as long as you've done some threat modeling and you understand where the integrity failures might creep in and then do something about to protect them. Security logging and monitoring. The community, this is one of the two community um, agreed items. In 2017, we held a two-day workshop at the Open Security Summit. Um, it was held somewhere in London. It was a great thing. I didn't go. I was there virtually. Um, we worked on how do we create the top 10? There was a lot of problems with people just felt the top 10 popped out of nowhere after a period of time. How is it built? And so, again, go to Brian's talk. He discusses this a lot. Um, but essentially, I would strongly recommend um, with security logging and monitoring, the previous talk about event um, stuff is really important. The reason why is people log, but they may not log security related events. And then if they do log security related events, are they actually looking at it and would they respond to it? And this is a bit of a problem for penetration testers because now that you've got this thing that you can't actually easily identify if it occurred, which is, did you detect me when I was busy hammering you? So what I would suggest is for those people who are not familiar with um, auditing, um, audit should be a legally protected profession and term. If you haven't got an accounting degree majoring in auditing, you should not be allowed to call yourself an auditor. But what they do is they actually um, uh, ask questions and then get evidence for the answers to those questions. So say, for example, they might ask to see um, that, yes, we have a receipt system and that people upload the receipts and we will not pay your expenses unless those receipts match up and they will sample the results. They will actually go and check a certain number of um, transactions. It's called sampling. It should be 5% of the total, but in many large organizations, it might just be 50 or 60. What they'll do is they'll pull them down just randomly and have a look and see whether or not they actually have the receipts. That If they actually do match up and did they get paid without receipts or if the things didn't match. 
So they're looking to see whether or not the controls are in place and effective and then getting evidence for it. So if you're a penetration tester, you've got no way of understanding would there, were, were there logs of me and were, what, what would you have done if uh, you discovered me? Um, you just need to ask. There's nothing wrong with asking. Go hard and then ask, did you detect me? And what would you have done about it? It's a very simple stage. You can do it a few days before you finish your work. Um, in many cases, you've got two or three days to do the write-up, sometimes less, sometimes a lot less. Um, but you can certainly ask the question and wait to see what the answers are. And then the newest one is server-side request forgery. And we were so happy to, um, Orange Josiah reached out to him um, he's one of the world's leading researchers of SSRF. Uh, if you're not familiar with his work, please look at him on Twitter. Um, he has links to a whole bunch of his videos and his research. If you don't know how to do SSRF today, please learn. It's really important, but I do hope that like XXE, it can get rid of it. All it really means is that you're accepting URLs and then the different parsers treat the URLs differently and they may have access to things that they shouldn't have. And so in cloud environments, it's dead simple. You just simply create virtual um, VPCs and network security groups that prevent people talking to each other. It's dead simple. Project, uh, can, apps can be isolated from each other. However, in traditional on-premises work, you may have a very flat internal network and SSRF is a lot more um, horrible to you um, because they can walk around your network and do all sorts of things. His Black Hat 2017 talk, he took over a source code, a public source code repository um, organization, just using SSRF. So please go watch some of his stuff. The work that he's done since 2017, it's like magic. If you've never seen SSRF done before, oh my goodness, you're in for a treat. Learn how to do it, it's dead simple. It does require a little bit of work on your behalf to set up. You do need a system that's on the internet that can be communicated with um, the servers you're testing, but it is, important you test if you've never tested for ssrf before practice 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 os juice shop has an ssrf lesson but because it's so problematic it's disabled by default you need to enable it so go ahead and practice ssrf in juice shop you may need to launch your own uh, version of it it's not in the version that's available online uh, you know through heroku or whatever you need to actually fire up your own juice shop and enable that lesson the next steps, we talked about this, uh, it covers off things such as code quality issues, denial of service and memory management errors. Uh, I've recently been learning Go. Um, we are seeing a resurgence of Go and uh, Rust being used for API servers. And although those languages are generally memory safe, um, a better way of putting it is they are memory safer. We are starting to see memory management errors such as integer overflows and unmanaged memory starting to creep back as being an issue. Um, if you are, if you have developers working with systems languages for your APIs, uh, you absolutely do need to spend some time reviewing code for memory management errors. Um, those languages, as I said, have a lot of checks, in particular Rust. If you stay within the borrower uh, mechanism that's built into Rust, you are going to be quite safe. If you go into um, Go or Rust and start using some of the lower level stuff that allows you to talk directly to memory in a way that it's not designed to do, yeah, you're going to have fun. So just wrapping this talk up, um, frameworks, 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 frameworks. If you have known dodgy frameworks and old frameworks that don't protect against bug classes, get rid of them. Um, if you have frameworks that you are looking to adopt, there are generally good frameworks out there like Vue, React, and others that will actually protect you from yourself if you convert your code to them. So always look out and see whether or not you can eliminate uh, bug classes by adopting a better framework, um, particularly if you're doing it for other reasons as well, such as a visual refresh, or you're moving away from an RDBMS to, a, say, for example, an OSQL engine. You can do much better as you come across and do that ref, that refactoring that's going to happen anyway. Uh, we do want you to improve your AFSEC program. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of stuff like the proactive controls, the ASVS, the cheat sheets, the web testing guide. 
I do want people, if you've got some spare time, please, please, please help out the Education, education and Training Committee. They are working on an industry and tertiary curriculum. They are working on the framework at the moment. I would encourage you to get involved. We really do need to have a open source, free to use um, industry and um, tertiary uh, curriculum that can be adopted by anyone. I really do uh, ask for assistance there. Um, Adrian Winkles, uh, who's part of, I believe, one of your um, uh, UK um, uh, chapters out there, is on the Education and Training Committee. I'm pretty sure he could use all the help that they can get. Uh, things are going a lot slower than I would expect. Okay, uh, we do have a Slack channel, the Project Top 10, and of course you can reach us at the um, at GitHub, but I will show you where the actual Top 10 is and what it looks like, and I'll take questions after that. Um, actually, while well, I just get this up, come on, Firefox, you can do it. It is that simple. It's literally os.org slash top 10. And here is the top 10. Um, one of the great things is we are now able to be translated and it works directly. Um, you know, we've got all these different um, languages that are coming in, such as Brazil, uh, yeah, Portuguese and whatnot. So um, absolutely, it's now consumable on a mobile uh, phone and whatnot. And it is fantastic. So one thing I will say to you is that there is this table that we're trying to figure out how to fix up and make look good. That doesn't work on a mobile phone. Just if you're interested in the actual data, um, we will be having data available in our GitHub repo, which is available at the top right here. Uh, if you're able to translate uh, to a, another language, please do come and talk to us. Um, we are very, very interested in translations and it's dead simple to do. Um, you literally, uh, you go to here, you click on fork and you present us with a pull request with a translation and we will get it reviewed uh, by another native speaker and from there it'll get put in and that's how the other ones have occurred. So we'll see if we've got any, yeah, we've got a Taiwanese version, uh, the Italian translation, um, you know, it's very simple for us to actually include um, your translations if you are prepared to do it. Um, just create a pull request against us and we'll get it done. Um, so questions. Excellent. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk, Andrew. Uh, I thought I knew stuff about the last top 10. Turns out that uh, there are a lot of inf very interesting points that you raised um, and you probably answered some of the questions that I had. Uh, let me just check if we have any questions on uh, YouTube Q&A and also on the uh, slider do. If you've got questions, please make sure you do use the YouTube Q&A and uh, slider do slash OWASP. Um, Andrea, do we have any questions? Can you please read them out? Sure. Um, so from YouTube, we've got um, a comment, I think, from Ed Staniel. Thank you. So he's um, talking about the insecure design um, item on that list, says that um, we could implement, we could complement this with guardrails approach, which, mm -hmm. yeah, to be more explicit about that, yeah, without, um, within building securely. So that's, that's more of mm -hmm. a comment. Yep. Um, um, that's a perfectly valid comment. We are actually looking um, for the long form version of the ASVS, uh, we're working on the ASVS version five, and we want to include some of that detail. We want to revise the architecture section um, in the ASVS to actually have um, more details on the guardrails, the paved road, and other mechanisms that people can adopt. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and we also have a couple of questions on Slido. So um, the first one is, about outdated libraries. Um, mm -hmm. not, this is about, this is quite interesting. Um, they're not always a vulnerability. So they say if mm -hmm. a new version bre breaks backward compa uh, compatibility, but doesn't fix any security issues, why should we upgrade? So what we're asking for is outdated software to be warned. And what we're doing there is making sure that you don't get stuck in like, um, one of the, <laughs> Back in the mid 2000s, there was this wonderful um, 
display framework called Struts. And Struts 2.0 was like, shouldn't even be called Struts. But people didn't prepare for it because it was so vastly different. Now, I've literally been working on a piece of code that was in Node 12, and I'm taking it up to Node 16. And you'd be surprised at just how hard that is. And I know that eventually Node 12 will become depressed, depre like I won't be able to get support for it. I need to be warned. I need to have some observability that there is a later version of Node. There's a safe version of Node 12 right now, but there is a later version of Node um, that you should be using. And that's what I'm asking for. If you've got a piece of code, you've pulled in a library, and you know, for example, one of the common complaints about this section is that library, we use this function, this bit over there that's vulnerable, we don't even call. Why would you uh, force me to update? Well, get into the habit of updating so that when there is a vulnerability that you need to patch in one day, you can, because it's not hard. Whereas if you let this slide forever and ever and ever, it becomes technical debt. And then when you've got three to four hours to redeploy your entire production stack because you've got a piece of code that is now extremely vulnerable, you can't. And you may get owned. Please don't do that. Provide observability for outdated components and then enforce vulnerable components. Perfect, that makes sense, thank you. Um, and the last question on Sligo is about cross-site scripting. Why is it gone mm -hmm. as a separate category? Um, this person That's does because... bounty, yeah, and, and it's still being published. It was still published as part of uh, their top 10 and still being paid out. Yes, so the reality is, is that we didn't want injections to not be in the OS top 10. And by just including the entire pattern, which is user supplied hostile input intermingled in program code, when we included every single CWE that has that pattern, it stayed in the OS top 10. If we withdrew cross-site scripting and HTML and JavaScript injection from that pattern, we wouldn't have had enough data to include injections at all. And then we would have lost both cross-site scripting and SQL injection out of the OS top 10. And I think that would have been a mistake. Yep. Um, thank you. And actually, there's one more question from my side. Um, as I'm daily struggling to get, you know, engineers to pay attention to me. <laughs> and actually, you know, I know that they care about security. I am fortunate enough to now work in a place where people know why it's important and why they should pay attention to it and why they need patching and they need to care for OWASP and everything else. But how would you actually go about convincing them that AppSec should be sort of embedded in what they do without thinking that, you know, you're overloading them, they're already extremely busy and extremely stressed. This is something that I'm always struggling to find out on my own. My first and best advice is be a part of the team, provide them the solution and say why it's important, um, not only to the business, but also to them. Um, if you constantly come in and say, I need you to fix this little tiny problem that's not hurt anybody, and you waste a lot of their time by giving them hundreds of like really big fat reports that don't even know where to start, you're not really a solution. You're actually an, an impediment to going live. Um, work on solutions with them, become a trusted partner. And once they start seeing you like performance testers as being a necessary part of getting out into production, uh, rather than just a hurdle that they have to get past, because they, you know, like performance testers, performance testers pull up and show that their code has to be improved. They don't want to do it, but the, the reality is, is that it can be really quite bad for the business if it doesn't work. Same with security. It's a cost that you have to pay. But if you're a part of the solution, it actually helps get over that hurdle and they trust you and you don't waste their time with little things. I think you'll have a much better relationship with them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. No yeah. worries. Uh, yes, excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Andrea. It was an amazing talk. We are seeing some good feedback as well. I think that's an impressive update to the um, OWASP top 10. And I think the fact that it's mobile is uh, mobile friendly is very important. Um, 
one interesting question uh, was, I think you may have kind of mentioned it during the, the talk, when is the PDF version going to be available? Because all other uh, OWASP top 10s exist as PDF in a nice sort of printable, publishable format. I even happen to own a uh, printed format, just one sec. Let me show you. This is this is a paper version of OWASP top 10 yep. 2007, which was actually Sorry. published and printed. Um, Sharif has tasked me with getting the books, uh, the OWASP books updated, and I think the OWASP top 10 would be a great one to start with. We're actually getting Hugo to take the markdown and actually apply his new graphic design. It'll have come out as an Adobe Illustrator file, and one of the problems we've got with opaque file formats like that is it's actually really hard for people to uh, work with those uh, opaque formats. Um, but as a PDF that we could then get published as a book, but also a PDF that could be available on the website, I think this is actually a good test to make sure that it works, uh, but also then we can start revitalizing our PDFs and um, books available to the wider public. Um, so I should have been at a leadership meeting, I'm missing it right now, um, where we're supposed to discuss this, but at the end of the day, this is actually quite important as well. So I'm sure my other Excellent. three colleagues... Excellent. <laughs> We'll get there. It's soon. It's soon. Trust me. On as soon as possible. But Fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. Great. I think this is it. I don't see any further questions in um, uh, Slido. Uh, there's, um, I don't think there's. Oh, no, there's one. Yeah, no, there's one. You. Yeah. Do you want to ask this one, Andrea? Sure. Um, so converting security into the language of the board, money, customers, profits. It's not happened to me. So why am I bothered? Uh, and bumping up the pipeline. So if you really want change, like I worked on a project in 2007 where they were trying to get the video of their annual general meeting up onto their website. Um, so this is early days for audio visual presentations on websites. You got to remember, you know, web 2.0 is brand new. When I showed them that I could put Rick Astley's um, Rickroll into the annual general meeting and make that thing they got to see, and then I said, I could make it your competitor's uh, promotion. I could make it an adult video. It got fixed. If you put it into the language of the board, the yeah, language of the business, things get fixed. If you concentrate on small technical issues that are easily resolved, that no one cares about, you're going to be irrelevant. Do spend the time to understand what drives the business. If you understand what drives the business, you'll be a very successful person, successful person in, in your company. Yep, perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. Excellent. Thanks very much, Andrew. I think we should probably start a new OWASP project, which is going to be like OWASP top 10 for the board, right? It's like a how to demo cross-site scraping to the board, how to how to demo the risk of insecure design or insufficient logging. Um, well, people are going to have to get better because Chrome has just got rid of uh, alert boxes from third-party websites. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so alert one, gone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> People will now have to find some other ways of, uh, you know, popping up um, uh, cross-site scripting proof of so, uh, proofs of concepts. Excellent. Okay. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, of course, amazing. Enough. Thank you very much for your time today with us at um, uh, the OWASP London. Uh, amazing talk. And yeah, we wish OWASP Top 10 project all the very best. And we're looking forward to seeing those printed books. And of course, OWASP Top 10 being available in more formats and in more languages as well. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, right. The last um, few words, just to remind everyone that if you'd like to follow us uh, and to make sure that you don't miss the next event, you can do it on our web, web page on owas.org. You can also follow us on Twitter. Um, we are also on Facebook. You can just like our page on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash owaslondon. Uh, we're also on Meetup uh, and on LinkedIn as well as OWASP London. Um, of course, you are watching us live on YouTube right now where we have a channel called OWASP London where we publish the recordings of all the past events for you so you can watch them again. We will also publish the slides uh, on our webpage as well. And of course, we're also on OWASP Slack. So if you'd like to join OWASP Slack, um, we have a dedicated channel for our chapter, chapter dash London. A reminder of the next event is going to be on October 19th and 20th. That's a free secure coding tournament for developers run by Secure Code Warrior. You can just register free 
and participate and um, the top prizes are 400 US dollar Amazon gift cards. Uh, I would like to say a big thank you to our speakers today, to Andre van der Stock and uh, Miriam Wiesner, and of course, to all our chapter supporters as well. And a reminder, if you would like to support OWASP London chapter, please get in touch. And uh, yeah, the final reminder that recordings will be available and uh, um, we will let you know once we start uh, running our events in real life, in person. Thanks very much, everyone, and stay safe. Bye.